So in this lab, an important component we'll be doing paternity tests and DNA profiling. So both the paternity tests and DNA profiling depend upon DNA. Rather than going into the structure of DNA, we'll just remind you of one important component of DNA. Right? Building blocks of DNA then are our nitrogen bases. As a reminder of what nitrogen bases are, they are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Now our adenine, our nitrogen bases then come in what are called sequences. An example of a sequence might be an AACCGT. Okay. So any sequence is possible, but this is an example of sequences, and sequences can be either be short or long. Now DNA in people then is basically housed in what are called chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes that occur in two sets of 23 or 23 pairs. One set comes from your mother, one set comes from your father. Now on these 23 pairs of chromosomes, here's a chromosome, let's say, from your father, here's a chromosome from your mother. Okay, geneticists have found on specific chromosomes that there are these areas that are highly variable. And inside these areas, basically, they have repeating units called short tandem repeats, or STRs. A short tandem repeat is basically an area that might repeat a single sequence. So here's an AACCGT. Maybe it repeats this AACCGT um, 10 different times. Okay. And the interesting thing is that because it's highly variable, then we might have a short tandem repeat of 10. Okay. 2, 15 short tandem repeats in these areas. And then these in genetic profiling and in, um, in maternity testing are called marker genes. Okay. And what we're going to do in this lab then is we're going to be basically looking at these marker genes on different chromosomes. And so FBI then has about 13 different marker genes that it uses. Paternity testing has about 16 different um, marker genes that um, common paternity tests use. In this class, then, we are going to be examining four different marker genes um, in this analysis. Now, I want you to turn in your lab manual to page 112. On page 112 is table 10.1. These are the four marker genes we are going to be using. We have a TPOX, and you can see from TPOX then, it basically has um, short tandem repeats of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. CSF1PO has short tandem repeats of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. DS D5S818, 10 through 14, and THO1, 7 through 10. So those are the marker genes we're going to be using. You'll also notice over here on table 10.1, this is important that we have frequencies of our Caucasian population. So for example, the 8 STR length of TPOX is about 51% in the population, whereas the 12 um, STR length of TPOX is only 5% in the population. Okay, that'll be important in your final calculations to pay attention to as well. So in this lab, then, you're going to do what's called an STR analysis on the samples. Okay. STR analysis then begins with our cell. From our cell, then, you would extract DNA. Right? Here's a segment of DNA. Okay, and let's say this is a specific chromosome, and the marker that we are looking at is right there. Basically, there's a sequence of um, nitrogenous bases here, another sequence here. We use things called primers. The primers then will recognize those sequences and excise this segment of DNA. Once we get that segment of DNA out, then what we do is we take it and we go through a process called PCR. Where PCR is called polymerase chain reaction, and all the PCR does is it just takes the segment of DNA 
and it amplifies it, or it makes tons and tons and tons of copies of that segment of DNA. Okay? Now what we have to do is we have to figure out how long each strand of DNA is, right? Because remember that our markers basically have a certain number of short tandem repeats. Let's say that this one has five STRs, right? Our next one, if we looked at the, let's say this is the father's DNA, our mother's DNA might have 10 STRs. So we just have to figure out how many STRs there are on those segments of DNA. PCR then amplifies it, so we have tons of copies of DNA, and if we get tons of copies of DNA, we can visualize this DNA through something called electrophoresis. And then not only can we visualize it, but we can look at the relative sizes of the DNA through the electrophoresis, and so we're going to do electrophoresis in this lab. Now I want to quickly just give you an example of how um, electrophoresis is going to work. So here's our table, right? We're going to look at the marker D5S818. It has allele sizes 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So these are short tandem repeats, okay? So here's our marker. Let's say that we have taken a sample. From that sample, then we have um, excised out this, the, this marker gene, and we have amplified it through PCR. Now what we're going to do is use electrophoresis to visualize that. Electrophoresis begins with a gel. This is a gelatin-like agarose gel where we've gone and we've molded it and made these little depressions which are called wells. We then take this gel and put it in a buffer solution which can carry an electrical charge. We hook it up to electrodes. We have our negative electrode here and we have our positive electrode there. We take a pipetta, we take our sample, and we put in like around 10 microliters of DNA into these wells. And we click on the electricity. DNA has a slightly negative charge in the buffer solution, so it's going to go toward the positive electrode. And let's say that this individual was heterozygous, so it had one different STR from its mother and one different STR from his or her father. And then we can have two different bands. So these are two different bands then in this individual. And these bands have moved and they move based upon size. So whether this one's bigger or smaller, think about this scenario. Think about a tugboat pulling a tugboat or a tugboat pulling an aircraft carrier. Okay, tugboat is way, way, way smaller than an aircraft carrier, so a tugboat's going to pull that small one faster. So this is going to be smaller than this one. Okay, let's say that we have another sample over here, and let's say that this STR length is the same. Same STR length is going to go the same distance, but let's say it's homozygous and that's the only one. Then we have another STR length here, and another one here. And finally, then we have our ladder, which are all of our basic STR lengths, where we have one here, one here, one here, one here and one here because in our table here we have five different STR lengths 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay. If this is our ladder with all of the STR lengths, then this one would be our smallest, which would be 10. This would be our biggest, which would be 14. And this would be 11, 12, and 13. So if you don't know the STRs on our gel, then this STR would be 14, this one would be 13, this one would be 12, this one would be 11, this one is not represented by any of these individuals. So if we wanted to know the genotype of this person by STRs, this person would have an 11 and a 14, this person would have only a 14, this person would have an 11 and a 13, and those are our three people. Okay, now let's say that we wanted to run a paternity test um, from this information. Okay, let's say that over here we have our um, we have our female or our mother. Over here we have our male or our father, and let's say that this is our baby. So the question is, did this baby 
come from the combination of this mother and this father. For the baby to come from the mother and the father, both alleles have to, you know, have come from the parents. So in this particular case, the baby is homozygous, so it has two of these short tandem repeats with 14 different repeats. Um, our mother has one, so our mother could have given this one, but our father could have only given a 13 or an 11. So if this had a um, 13 or an 11 in addition to the 14, then it could have come from this mother and father. But since the baby is homozygous, has two 14s, the father should have, would have had to have had a 14 to be the father of that baby. So this baby is not the product of this mother and this father. So to finish up for this particular lab then, I've turned to page 113 of your lab manual. Okay, here's information on how to run a paternity test. Students find this valuable and actually they do really well at just going through step by step and working through this table for the paternity testing. Okay, and then look at this table for the genetic profile probability. Okay, so when you have to make your genetic profile probability, just work through this step by step and students do pretty well at just following these two and figuring out how to do those.